Hello, my name is Gabe Volkoski. If you're curious about uh, who I am, it's right there. Oh, this side. It's right there. So I've been teaching for just over 30 years and I've observed quite a few teenagers with their parents. And I have to say that a great metaphor for making decisions about parenting, particularly teenagers, is that no matter where you step on the path, you're gonna step in something. Making parenting decisions is extremely complicated and the stakes are high so everything that we talk about we want to be aware that situations are infinitely complicated and different so whatever i'm saying right now might apply to one person's family and maybe not another so let's talk about this teenage child of yours and why they act so well like a teenager I'm sure you've all heard about the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, and the synapses, and myelin, and all of those things, but I'm just gonna talk about it for a moment to give it a little context for teenagers. Most adults, okay, some adults, are able to use their prefrontal cortex in a lot of ways. It helps them keep appointments, it helps them understand and empathize with how people might be feeling, it helps them read a room, it helps them to negotiate their way through emotional situations. Teenagers, are just starting to connect and build their prefrontal cortex. That means that they can be misreading things, you name it. If you're concerned, they might think you're angry. If you're worried, they might think you're disappointed. So, awesome! All of these developments are happening extremely slowly, which may be causing your teenager to take a little bit longer to do things than you really would like them to. It also might be leading them to be, let's say, moody. So I guess what I'm saying is it's important to give your teenager a break. I assume that you're hoping that your child, when they get older, will have a loving relationship with music, that they'll want to get their instrument out and play by themselves or with friends or maybe with strangers as a way of getting to know them. So just to give us a framework for this video, I'm going to give a brief description of a man whose name is Eric Erickson. <coughs> Who on earth would name their kid Eric Erickson? That is crazy. It sounds like somebody made that name up. Oh, he did make up that name? Oh. Dr. Eric Erickson felt that our lives developed in a sort of predetermined way, and he broke it into eight stages. Trust versus mistrust. Autonomy versus shame. This person, five-year-old. Industry versus inferiority. <laughs> Identity versus role confusion. This is the stage where you're teenager, adolescent, is trying to figure out who they are, trying to figure out what their identity is and whether they really know what it is at this time. What? Intimacy versus isolation. Generativity versus stagnation. And two thumbs. Integrity versus despair. Miss my mom. Here's the thing with Erickson. With him, there's always a crisis going on. Gosh, such a drama queen. In a sense, each of the stages is sort of like the dark side and the light side of different points in development. Everybody goes through these things and ultimately when they reach old age, we all hope that we feel a sense of wisdom and integrity and not despair at having wasted our lives or uh, behaved in ways that we're not proud of. So let's review Erickson's principles from a Suzuki perspective. Each stage in the learning process comes from the perspective that we are always teaching the whole person, not just a skill. So right now, that type of feeling, that feeling of identity confusion, trying to find out who they are, absolutely has to factor in to how they are learning their violin. Starting from the third stage, the Suzuki Triangle can kick in beautifully. The child is learning how to do things by themselves with the encouragement of the parent and the expertise of the teacher. Industry versus inferiority, when your child is comparing themselves to other, the Suzuki group class is a perfect place for that, where the environment is hopefully kept so that all children are encouraged to be themselves 
and not to feel inferior just because they can't do something as well as somebody else. Here's the point in the Suzuki Triangle where things start to change shape. This is the first time that taking a step back is so crucial for you. Up to this moment, your child has had their instrument most likely in their hands through almost every other stage of development. So of course right now they're gonna question it. It would be a little unusual if they didn't question it. You might feel like your role in the Suzuki Triangle has ended, but ho oh, ho ho, it has not. You do have to take a step back and allow your teenager to explore what they're doing on their own. Sometimes um, I don't feel like I practice as much as I should, but like when I do practice, which I'm doing like a lot though still, um, I actually like enjoy doing it since I'm the one like taking the like initiative, I guess, not just like, not my parents forcing me to do it. So it's not like a chore, it's like something I actually wanna do. This may mean for a while you're gonna hear practicing that you don't like. That is, of course, what's gonna happen when they're on their own. There's going to be a bit of a drop in quality. Before your kid reaches the teenage years, you wanna make sure that they feel like they're having some choice and decision along the way about what they play. Sometimes the Suzuki method can feel quite regimented and that's good, but I think it's also really good to consider some of the supplemental material out there. Um, and I think there's a lot that you can look at. We want not just to teach them a skill, but we wanna teach them to follow their desire, to go where they see beauty and wanna recreate it. That's how they start to form their identity around their instrument, so that when they arrive at these teenage years, they feel a sense of connection with their instrument. I listened to a lot of violin music when I was like learning and well, I mean, I still do, but mm -hmm. like in high school and middle school, I listened to a lot of music. And I think one of the most meaningful things to me about getting to choose repertoire was getting to play things that I had heard over and over again that I had come to really love and then getting to play them myself and having an even like closer relationship to the piece is how I sort of felt about it regular, casual performances where people are listening, not on their devices or doing something else, but listening and being moved by the playing that's happening. I think it's important to realize the dangers of using competition too much with teenagers. It gives them a strange sense of how they fit in and not really a good one. You either have a false sense of superiority or a false sense of inferiority at the end. I think it's the rare team who can really negotiate through that. I think it did make me feel less motivated because I um, I didn't feel like I was I had like a necessarily as much of a purpose for playing as I did when I was just playing for myself and I was just focusing on my own personal improvement when the emphasis was so much just in the general atmosphere on competing with each other among the students and stuff like that. Um, I think I did feel less motivated. I mean, I was still motivated, but I think I was motivated by something other than what I should have been, or what I wanted to be motivated by. Finding ways for them to play chamber music in environments that are nurturing and supportive is really important. Just listen to this student talk about how she feels about chamber music and how it might even inform what she wants to do in her professional life. Some people I know feel very, they really, <clears throat> like feel a strong, they feel the most like connected to their instrument and to music when they're in orchestra because of the sense of being part of something larger and stuff like that. But in my experience, I feel the most um, satisfaction playing the violin when I'm playing in a smaller ensemble setting or by myself because, um, I mean, in a chamber group specifically, there's just, um, every person in the chamber group sort of has their own individual role and you can, it's very obvious how the group would not be the same without even one individual person. And it certainly gives everyone a greater responsibility and also, I think for me, an even greater like sense of purpose. Not everyone wants to be a professional musician when they grow up, but to listen to the, her description of why she enjoys it, that's what every teenager really needs. There are some instances where in order for your teenager to really understand who they are and form an identity, they 
might decide they don't really want to have anything to do with music for a while. And it might be time to quit. <laughs> Topic of quitting is very difficult for teachers, especially in the Suzuki method, because we feel we've really invested our hearts in these children. But if there's a choice between your child forming their identity and quitting something, I think the choice is clear. While quitting is obviously a last resort, there's no shame in deciding you don't want to do something anymore. And just as it's important to really work at the things you care about, it's also important to let go of the things that you don't. This is what I was talking about with no matter where you step, you step in something. It's not an easy decision to make. Hey, we're all just trying to grow up. And we make a lot of mistakes along the way. And the more compassionate we can be with ourselves and each other, the better our world will be. And I know that's what Dr. Suzuki was hoping for. Gabriel Gabrielson. Gabe Gabison. Gabe Gabison. Okay. Okay. <laughs>